Next up, we're going to hear from a commissioner who has made it his job to speak up for people who are on the wrong side of the digital divide. He has a long history of public service. He has worked for the FCC, DOJ, and government and in private sector. He has a um, host of degrees and credentials that anyone outside of D.C. would say that he is a Washington insider, but what is always comforting is to find out that he is very approachable and always willing to have a constructive conversation. Please welcome Kansas native <laughs> Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. We'll start with that. Maybe I should end with that. Um, you know, uh, so honored to be here today. Glad, of course, uh, that there was a video inter 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 intercession between Larry, uh, somebody that I've looked up to for quite some time, and clearly somebody who's still passionate and dynamic and quite an advocate on issues that matter to all of us. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me, Francella, and to everyone at Next Century Cities. Uh, certainly looking forward to the conversation, to the ongoing dialogue that happens here today. Uh, and Next Century Cities brings together people, as was made on a partisan basis, uh, on non-ideological lines, certainly something that we need more of here in Washington, D.C. And so I uh, wanted to take a few minutes uh, here before I sit down for a little bit of a conversation uh, to talk about what I'm thinking about for the year ahead uh, here in 2020. It's always a good time to um, stop and reflect on what happened last year. I've been a commissioner for about a year and what I'm looking forward to in this coming year. My principal focus is going to be on ensuring that our communication networks are um, uh, pr on privacy, on security, and in particular on the democratic values that I think have to be reflected throughout uh, our policy considerations. And I don't need to tell you, especially some of the local officials here in the audience that are working to connect their communities and connect their cities, that broadband clearly has not reached all Americans. As you heard, um, it's been 25 years uh, since the phrase digital divide. Uh, and so, you know, I've uh, introduced a new term that I use where I call it an internet inequality. Uh, because when you're talking about 25 years, you're talking about a long-standing, persistent issue of who has and who has not. And so I think we have to kind of up a little bit of the game, up a little bit of the conversation. There is a moral imperative here to make sure that we are connecting folks. And clearly, this is not a temporary condition. It's a, uh, the need is only growing more urgent. Low-income people, people of color, people in rural areas, people in urban areas are not getting online or having to make great sacrifices in order to get connected. A Pew Research uh, study recently said that only 45% of adults with incomes under 30,000 have broadband at their home. And so that means driving to the library to fill out those job applications, joining the wait list, the long wait list on some of those Wi-Fi hotspots that come from libraries. And there's a striking loss of dignity when you go and talk to folks, whether they're in urban areas or in, uh, in rural areas, the striking loss of dignity that you really hear from people when they have to work so much harder uh, to have something that so many of us truly take for granted. Solving this, as I said, is a moral imperative. It's essential to our global competitive, uh, competitiveness going forward. Other countries are investing enormously uh, to get their citizens connected to high-speed quality broadband. China, for example, plans to deploy fiber optic cables to 80%, 80% of China's homes. And if we're leaving millions of our fellow Americans behind, our country is truly going to fall behind. And at the FCC, one of the vehicles, the prominent vehicle that we have for this is the Universal Service Fund, where we distribute millions of dollars each year, um, billions of dollars, bringing unserved communities uh, broadband. The problem, nevertheless, persists. And so it's important that we need to make some changes to the Universal Service Fund if we're going to finish the job. So I've called for, first, we have to fix broadband data. The mapping is clearly a broken problem here from the FCC. And when we're funding off of broken maps and broken data, you end up with a result that is deeply problematic. We still continue to make these funding decisions based upon mapping data that doesn't reflect the reality of where broadband service is and is not. Second, we haven't done enough to ensure that once broadband is available, that people can actually afford it. Affordability is something that I have called for and I'm going to continue to call for over the course of my commissionership. The average family, the average American family spends $2,700 per year on their internet, on their cable, and on their phones. And you know, we talk about digital divides. 
but that truly is a bridge too far for a lot of families. Uh, and for many of those working families dealing with increasing expenses, nearly flat incomes, uh, it's just simply too much. And so I think the FCC has to do more, has to put more of a pressure on uh, focusing on affordability, including at the very minimum gathering and studying price information so that we can have an accurate picture of market, the marketplace that consumers are actually facing. Finally, uh, I think we need to envision a connectivity for the future. Uh, and that means building uh, something that is going to be future-proof. And I've called for the FCC in particular to conduct a 10-year data-driven look back uh, because what we're finding is that uh, we are actually starting to use universal service dollars to go back to communities that we previously already had investments in. Why is that? We need to understand that before we continue to plow more dollars going forward. It's increasingly urgent that we get everyone connected faster and more ubiquitous networks are on the horizon and we need to make sure that the application folks are talking about driverless cars virtual reality robotic surgery uh, and it will also enable smart cities uh, that are going to drive the advancements that we're all talking about the more efficient use of public utilities which is going to help our environment help our climate greater traffic management will help our transportation systems all of this is going to be reliant on broadband. Everyone should have access to those innovations and how they shape our culture. Constant connectivity will create unprecedented amounts of data that is going to record what we do, where we go, who we're with. This data big bang is going to be significant and it is going to change the world around us. It's a critical moment and so we must undertake a thoughtful and continuous examination of these new capabilities and decide right now how we are going to ensure that they are poised to serve the future that creates opportunities for all rather than reinforcing some of the existing inequities. A lot can go wrong and a lot is going to happen on our watch. Where do you stand? And we're already seeing some early warning signs that big data may be creating a culture that we don't want to live in. Certainly one that gives me great heartburn. A recent study concluded that low-income communities in the digital age exist as both hyper-visible and invisible, over-included and excluded. For example, communities are disproportionately targeted by biased artificial intelligence, uh, systems that at the same time they are captured by uh, not captured by hiring algorithms, but instead scour the internet for other candidates. At the same time, we know that they are um, uh, facial recognition uh, is capt over capturing them and excluding them. Communities of color face these challenges. Research recently published just in December of 2019 by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, found that facial recognition algorithms misidentify people of color more often than white men. How, you know, to what degree? In the study, Asian and African American people were over 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white men. Over 100 times. Native Americans had the highest false positive rates of all ethnicities. Women were also more likely to be misidentified, also based on age. We are talking about demographics that we have to pay attention to. And some of these biases may be corrected, corrected through uh, greater transparency, scrutiny, uh, but many Americans without access to the technology that we're talking about, particularly broadband, are going to remain the most acutely vulnerable. Artificial intelligence increasingly means those who see opportunities for housing, for education, for employment, uh, and people on the wrong side of this digital divide are going to find themselves not hearing about that good job or the affordable mortgage or exacerbating the inequalities that we know are in our country. We must work to connect all Americans to these modern communications. I'm also mindful of the need to secure networks. Folks, uh, have, uh, folks that follow the FCC closely have noted that I have gone uh, really hard on making sure that we protect our networks and that network security is national security. Threats like unlawful surveillance attack our security. And current networks make us vulnerable. That's why I've been working over the last year on a framework to remove untrustworthy equipment, in particular uh, Huawei and ZTE's equipment from our communication networks. We should be rightly concerned. 
The Financial Times reported in 2017 that the Chinese government supplied Huawei servers at the African Union headquarters in Ethiopia and that it had been transferring information to Shanghai each night from uh, midnight to 2 a.m. This occurred for over five years. And so finding this untrustworthy equipment in our system, fixing it, uh, and funding it is going to be an essential part of our national security. It needs to happen as quickly as possible. I also remain committed to ensuring that security isn't just a luxury for the wealthy. As many of you know, our Lifeline program subsidizes broadband and voice service. For low-income people, many providers that participate in the Lifeline program offer free or inexpensive phones as part of that package. Earlier this month, uh, I was alarmed that an intelligence analyst at Malwarebytes Labs reported that at least one Lifeline carrier creates backdoors, uh, is offering a discounted phone that has pre-installed apps that create backdoors for future access, enable auto installations of other apps. And, and this occ occurs all without the Lifeline user's knowledge. Uh, and their own volition. That gives me great pause. And so I'm investigating this practice. We'll be exploring uh, the ways that the FCC can better protect our low-income consumers who have Lifeline phones. And right now, the FCC doesn't quite have a good track record on these issues. As I wrote over a year ago in the New York Times uh, in an op-ed, uh, talking about the need for those that have location data, in particular carriers that are tracking our location data from the cell phones that we all have, uh, we're selling that information to bounty hunters and selling that information downstream uh, and uh, without telling their customers. We at the FCC have not quite taken action, uh, and I think it's well past time for us to do so. You should not have to decide between having a phone and having your privacy. So finishing up, uh, looking ahead, I am optimistic uh, that technology developments are going to um, uh, continue to drive further our economy, drive our climate, and in particular, 5G is going to improve our networks and security. 5G offers these features from virtualization to uh, the expanded use of encryption that I think is going to be an important part of securing our phones and securing our networks. But these features are only going to be effective if they are rigorously and consistently implemented and applied. And so in the coming months, I'm going to continue to meeting with our leaders, our communications leaders, providers, equipment manufacturers, all to talk about how we can take advantage of these benefits, in particular with 5G, but truly making it more ubiquitous. A number of big challenges, but a number of big opportunities. We should all make sure to prioritize working together. Uh, and I'm glad to be here today to hear your thoughts um, and what you're working on. And if we can work together, we can build that future for a more advanced, a more secure, a more prosperous future, and more equitable for all. So thank you for having uh, me share a couple of my thoughts with you and looking forward to a little conversation here. Yeah. Okay, well, well, good morning, and I am, I have the honor of, of, of doing the Q&A with Commissioner Starks, and it is quite an honor. Thank you, Next Century Cities, for arranging this. Um, so just a few questions. Um, first of all, I like the, the internet equality term. I mean, oh, I've, been, I've been around uh, whenever the digital divide term was coined, so I'm not quite a social security age, but I, I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you for your commitment for improving the quality of the broadband mapping data. Yes. Um, so the next panel will be discussing the difference between broadband access and adoption, noting that affordability continues to be an ongoing obstacle. And you mentioned this as far as the FCC looking at the quality of the data. Will you, be, will you support the FCC collecting and making publicly available broadband pricing information? Yes. It, you know, I think affordability is um, an integral part of, uh, of extending broadband here. You know, for folks that um, know how I got interested in technology issues and, you know, ultimately kind of um, uh, set on the path of ultimately becoming an FCC commissioner was I was back in Kansas City. Uh, where I was um, 
in a black barbership, bar barber shop back home uh, and was truly getting my hair cut and a very timely, uh, this was about 10, 11 years ago, uh, was getting my hair cut uh, and we were arguing about the Chiefs. Uh, and and if, if anybody who's, you could abstract it and they could talk about any debate, but in particular when you're talking about a sports debate, lots of times people have uh, their own opinions, strong opinions, but they don't frequently have their own facts, and they don't have their facts straight. Uh, and so we were talking about, uh, talking about the Chiefs arguing, and I remember uh, I got up from the chair, and I said, well, let's all go home and look it up. And then when I come back and get a haircut next time, we'll figure out who's right and who's wrong. Uh, and as I'm getting up from the chair, everybody's kind of looking at me like, what, what is he talking about? And again, this is 10, 11 years ago. How, where would you go look up Chief's facts? And it quickly dawned on me, uh, uh, very quickly, that I was the only person who had fixed internet broadband to my then apartment uh, in Kansas City. And so you're talking about a whole block barbershop full of African American folks who really did not have any connectivity. And I distinctly remember walking out and thinking, I hope somebody is trained focused on that issue because this is a community that is getting left behind. And so certainly now it's something I think about every day. So it's my problem, but it's all of our problem, really. Uh, and so I think affordability is a critical aspect of this. Uh, with universal service dollars, I have laid out uh, that I think that we ha absolutely have to have our universal service folks provide an affordable option if we're paying for them to get broadband out. That's certainly on the rural end. With regard to affordability, um, uh, like I mentioned in my remarks, $2,700 the average American family pays for their phone, for their internet, for their cable. Uh, and for a lot of folks, that's just simply not gonna work. And so these phones are powerful now. They do more than ever. Uh, but they really are very hard to do work on, to do homework on. Uh, it would be very hard to have your phone do your kid's homework. It's very hard to fill out a job application in a lot of ways uh, to telework. How many people in this room telework um, um, you know, from home at some point, right? And obviously we're talking about a certain cohort here, uh, but we all telework. It, you know, one of the things that I've started to think about truly is the future of work. Uh, you heard some of the remarks from Larry Irving, uh, and I see it more clearly from my aperture that um, uh, the future of work is going to displace a lot of folks who do something that can be automated, something that is repetitive. And so a lot of folks are going to need to start to work from home. We need to make sure that they have the affordable options that they need to make sure that they get connected. Thank you. So what is the agency doing to ensure that providers submit maps that reflect accurate coverage and performance data? Should there be penalties for repeat offenders? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, because this is an issue, um, you know, as was mentioned in my bio, you know, I'm, uh, I worked at the Department of Justice in the Obama administration. Uh, I was an enforcement lawyer for the FCC before I became a commissioner. And so making sure that the enforceability of our rules is something that means a lot to me. Uh, and I think it's something that we really have to focus on. Uh, in December, we had a four and a half billion dollar program that was called Mobility Fund 2. And it, the program was basically designed to get mobile service out out to more rural areas, more folks that otherwise do not have connectivity. We had to mothball the program because the carriers that submitted the data, it was so poor, we actually couldn't even make funding decisions based upon uh, how, how truly inaccurate the data was. It turns out in December that the chairman announced that we weren't going to hold folks accountable for submitting that poor data. The report that was issued by, um, uh, by the chairman said that this data was so inaccurate that it would have led to miscalculations, misallotments of money. But we weren't gonna hold folks accountable essentially because they've been submitting such poor data all along that there was nothing that we were really gonna be able to, to do about it, to hold them accountable for. I thought that was uh, uh, the wrong way to go. 
I thought we should have held folks accountable because Americans are depending on us to make sure that we hold folks accountable when uh, dollars are going to flow to misappropriated ways. Uh, and so I do think, to answer the question more clearly, um, that the SEC has fallen down on its task there in a lot of ways. Do Next question. Do yeah. FCC commissioners solicit information from citizens and local governments on their funding and implementation challenges for broadband deployment? Aside from public comment, how does the FCC gather input on, on its public, the policy proposals? Yes, uh, you know, obviously I won't uh, speak for all, uh, for the other commissioners, but I do know that all of us uh, do travel. We do all get out to see communities. I know it's been a specific priority of mine uh, over the last year and something that I continue to do. Um, you know, I think of um, uh, the librarian that I met, Ms. Cynthia Aguilar, uh, down in Albuquerque. She's in one of the pueblos there at San, uh, Santo Domingo. She's a librarian. And when I sat down with her, she specifically told me um, that getting broadband here to our small community was the same as when the trains came to town. That's how much it had impacted the community that they were able to, to, to change and feel that they were in the modern world. Uh, I meet with Miss um, Eleanor, who was out in the Grove Oak branch in, um, on the outside of, of, of Boston, uh, almost as you get towards like Brookline. Uh, and she, part of the uh, Tech Goes Home program that they have there at the Boston Public Libraries, uh, was able to uh, learn how to use the internet for the first time was able to get a computer through a program. If you complete a six-week program, um, they'll um, uh, sell you a computer for, I think it was $25, something like that. Uh, and so she gets to use a computer. The library there is actually adjoined to a senior center that she was a part of. And so you're talking about somebody who, uh, at, her, at her grand age, she didn't tell me her age, by the way, uh, but she was in the senior center. Um, got connected for the first time. And what she really loves to do uh, with a twinkle in her eye is she told me she likes to watch YouTube line dancing and, 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 and learn new dances. Uh, and so there are so many ways, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be traveling to Miami uh, this coming weekend. Unfortunately, I'm going to miss my Kansas City Chiefs playing in the Super Bowl. But I am going to Miami this coming weekend. And one of the things I'm looking forward to seeing there uh, is um, a, a community where they're taking women who have, uh, uh, do not have the set of skills, um, uh, do not have the educational attainment that um, uh, might otherwise make them employable, but they send them through a, a, a course, like a 12-week course, that gives them the skills, teaches them how to code, teaches them how to be computer literate, digitally, digitally literate, uh, and then puts them into the workforce. And so it's a tremendous program that I'm looking forward to seeing. All of these things are really important to make sure that I champion, that I go and see uh, firsthand uh, tribal issues, uh, so many of these issues, urban issues, rural issues. I have visited all sorts of communities to make sure uh, that they know the importance of the internet, um, that help is on the way, uh, and that it really is something that um, uh, the more you see that how 5G is going to change our world, the more upset I get about folks that are getting left behind. And it really is an issue that I will not allow those who have much to get even more uh, while other folks are, are, are further left behind. And I think it's, uh, do we have time for one more question? Just one more, okay. Boss says. That's right. <laughs> uh, as Congress and the FCC continue to think through solutions for a digital divide, local access, and adoption programs to fill in the gaps, and we know there are many gaps, um, has the FCC offered any policy proposals that are specifically designed to support local initiatives and expand broadband access? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, first of all, um, uh, you know, at the start of the question there, uh, there is some really good legislation uh, out there. The Digital Equity Inclusion Act. Digital Equity Act. Uh, I know it is from uh, Congressman McNerney, um, Congresswoman Clark is on it, and Congressman Luan, I think, were uh, some of the co-sponsors. I think that's a tremendous piece of legislation that is going to ultimately, if it can get passed, um, um, 
get money into local uh, local hands. Obviously, from the FCC's perspective, uh, you know, uh, two programs that certainly come to mind are the E-rate program, where we specifically fund um, libraries and schools, uh, and the rural hospital program, uh, where we also are funding broadband access connections uh, to some of the rural hospitals that really need it. Thank you for the time. Enjoy your day, and make sure, um, uh, you know, I truly do have an open door. Um, if folks want to come see me, uh, you know, I can't tell you uh, Next Century Cities and some of the other associations that come visit me regularly, uh, how impactful it is to hear from you and hear from folks um, in DIA uh, is another powerful advocate in this space. You know, I won't name names. It's like picking amongst my, my favorite kids here. Uh, it, it, but, but truly, uh, the advocacy uh, is much needed. Uh, it is much appreciated, and uh, I hope it continues with the strength that it has. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Starks, for making time. We appreciate you. And also um, to his staff, especially uh, Austin Bonner, Elisa Valentin. Those are people who make things happen behind the scenes, and we are grateful for you. Um, to uh, Rondella Hawkins, uh, you made a comment that it was an honor to have that conversation. And I think one thing that's really important is that it is an honor to have people from local districts in Washington, D.C., so that people do not forget that there is a local impact of the conversations that we're having.